the 2018 Subaru Crosstrek. Built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. The goal of any landscape designer usually boils down to one simple thing, enhance the natural beauty of the location. But achieving that goal is rarely simple because so much is dictated by the site itself. The environment, the location, the topography, enhancing the natural views while minimizing others, the history of the property, the existing wildlife, even access into the landscape itself. Each of those presents its own set of challenges in bringing to life the goals of the client. When you add to that the mandate that the design has to have a light environmental footprint and then be self-sufficient after the crew leaves, that's a tall order for any designer, especially when you consider that the property is over eight acres in size and isolated on an island with some of the most majestic views you'll ever see. And it's a once in a lifetime project for any designer lucky enough to get the job, especially with lots of design lessons that anyone can apply at home. Well, that's our story today. Welcome to Whidbey Island. At the northern end of Puget Sound in Washington State, you'll find Whidbey Island. 30 miles north of Seattle, it's the largest of the islands that make up Island County. 37 miles from end to end, it ranges from 10 miles wide to just a mile and a half wide in some places. 80,000 people live on Whidbey, which is also home to a sizable community of artists, musicians, and writers. And while many of them no doubt draw inspiration from the panoramic views of the Cascade Mountains and the natural remote setting, there are other features of the island that can make it challenging for certain artists. Gardening in the Pacific Northwest presents a lot of opportunities. I don't see them as challenges. Stacy Crooks is a nationally recognized landscape designer, gardener, horticultural educator, and a native of the Pacific Northwest. So we here have glacial till, which is left over from the last ice age that came through here about 17,000 years ago. And basically it scraped all the soil off the top of the surface and we have a lot of rock and sand and hard glacier till, a lot of granite that's predominant in the Cascades. Uh, so the challenges are finding plants, trying to establish plants in this glacier till that will thrive and be sustainable. A lot of people say, oh, you must have so many options, how many, you know, all these plants that you can grow in the Pacific Northwest, all the perennials and everything grows so fast here. And they're successful in the Pacific Northwest because they're tailored to the Mediterranean palate. So we're the same as the Mediterranean, Chile, parts of Australia, um, parts of South Africa and we can grow all the plants here in the Pacific Northwest that grow in those regions. They're all like regions. We have three or four months of dry weather and we have lots of rain in the wintertime. In comparison to the East Coast, it rain, where it rains all summer, here it doesn't rain at all in the summer. I have a very small plant palette. I have a true tested drought tolerant plant palette that I use and it never lets me down.
Stacy would need a good go-to bag of tricks for the project that came her way in 2013, a new client approached Stacy, a writer who was building a home on Whidbey Island on the area called Midden Cove. And the eight and a half surrounding acres would need a special touch. She called this her sanctuary. When I first met her, she said, this, welcome to my sanctuary. And it was really important to her that I understood what that meant to her. It's about the land, it's about the light, it's about not intruding on the space and the uh, beauty of the land itself. And in this particular garden, which is on the Puget Sound, has a uh, reflection of water, a lot of blue sky, open sky. So I don't like to compete with the view. So the most uh, important thing for the client is they bought the property with a view. So they want to enhance the view, they don't want to compete with it. It was an old orchard and um, she wanted to keep it open. We didn't want to plant a lot of trees here, but we wanted to create a garden that was beautiful, tranquil, um, functional, and aesthetically beautiful. And Stacy's client had one overriding mandate that would drive everything. This particular piece of land here is eight and a half acres and I was asked to do a light footprint when I built this garden so there's no fences it's open to the deer I got to create meadows the deer sleep in the meadows here there's lots of rabbits lots of birds owls mice um, all different kinds of birds here Work on the epic project spread out over four years, but to walk through now, it's a stunning landscape that looks magazine cover perfect, but also 100% natural. What's even more impressive is that Stacy stuck to her directive and created a totally sustainable landscape in the process. You know, Stacy. in the last few years of our traveling the country to film shows and different gardens and landscapes, I am seeing more and more of these meadows as an element of that overall design. And I have to say, I love it. It really provides that soothing feature and mm -hmm. it connects the landscape from mm -hmm. one area to the next too. Mm -hmm. So when I got to design this garden, it was one of the major components that I wanted to really bring into the design. Mm. So this meadow wraps all the way around this eight acres mm. and I used it wherever I could, keeping in mind that there was mowed paths for uh, people to visit and stroll along them and walk their pets. And um, But it brings in the insects and the birds and the deer lay in here and take <laughs> naps in the sunshine. And it's only mowed once a year. Right. It's only mowed in, in August. And so you've got low maintenance, yep. which is a big part no of water. a sustainable design. Yep. No water. It's yep. attracting wildlife, yep. lots of insects and yep. birds. Yep. yep. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. It is. It's a win-win. It really is. If you've got the space to do it, it's, it's beautiful. Most people think they're quite easy. You just stop mowing your grass and you have a meadow, but you, it's really quite the long process. It took about five years to get it to where it is now. It's two years of eradication, of stripping off the top layer of thistles, invasive species, and, and everything you don't want in your lawn, and then uh, letting it sit, go fallow, and eradicating the things that come up through the seeds that are still there or that are being dropped by birds, thistles, things like that. And then we amended the land with uh, chicken manure, turned it all over and created a, a base for hydro seeding and we seeded it with a meadow seed. And so they were treated like a lawn in the beginning. So we irrigated them the first two summers and cut them like a lawn. We cut them long, but we cut them so that the root systems could develop deep. And then last summer was the first summer, it was the fifth summer. We didn't cut them. But when we cut it last August, I thought it would just be a big tangled mess, but they just cut it with a big field mower and just let it lay. And it went through the winter like that and, and all the new grass and all the new, it just became its own fertilizer like when you thatch your lawn and it came right up through it and it was just, it's been beautiful. It, there's a lot of wildlife in here now, m more than there was before. 
By keeping large open areas that are uninterrupted, you create an open flight pattern. You're gonna get bigger birds, you're gonna get more woodpeckers and sparrows, things that fly faster in groups and colonies, and they're gonna, you're gonna have more space. They're gonna come in because they can see they're safe, they have great places to land and hide. So it, in, it encourages more habitat activity and more exploration and searching for food. And there's just a lot more birds here. I know there's more birds here than when I first came here. And the deer roll around, they just sleep in it. I mean, they've sent me pictures here where they'll get up in the morning, there's like deer sleeping all over the, out in the meadows. It's pretty amazing actually. The meadows have been really, for me, the, 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 just the really glory of this property has really been terrific to watch it happen. The natural lay of the open land also gave Stacy the opportunity to create another of the landscape's key features, a bog. I came here in June and I was here evaluating everything, working with drawings and bids and contractors, trying to figure out what would we would do and get the final plan done and what it would cost. And I watched the bog and the stream and they never let up. It was wet, moist, soggy the whole time, all through August into September. So I knew I was gonna to get to build a real bog in a place that it should be. You're not successful if you try and change the natural topography. The too much of the grade has to stay pretty much the same. I have never had success building a bog that wasn't naturally already there. It's just if you've already got it, you can't fill it. It will, it will come back. It will just seep up. It just needs to be there. So we enhanced it. We, we, we uh, eradicated a lot of the um, weeds out of it, the blackberries and things like that, and the alders that were growing in it, the seedling alders, and scraped the bottom, added more subsoil with clay in it, and then planted pussy willows and gunneras and um, things that you would natural things in a bog. And it's full of horsetails, but those that's where they want to be, and you can't fight them. You gotta learn to love them. If you chop one up, you're gonna have 50. If you pull it, it's gonna spread underground into more. So we decided to, to leave the horsetails. And I think it's really pretty. It's pretty. I mean, it's part of it. It's just part of it. And they're not anywhere else because we haven't disturbed the soil. That's another reason not to change the topography. Every time you change it, something's gonna happen. It's gonna change a lot of things, not just one thing. Not just the shape, but it's gonna change. It's gonna change its own little ecosystem. If you can work with the natural topography, you're light years ahead of trying to change anything because it's already here, it's already settled. Whether it's dealing with the existing lay of the land or working within her self-described small plant palette of proven performers, not fighting mother nature is one of Stacy's top tips for home gardeners too. You can't emphasize it enough to use the right plant in the right place. So it's, a, it's also about the combinations of the right plants. So I always try and put like plants together. Plants that require a little more water and let the other plants that need no water live together. So you're not only saving resources, those particular gardens are going to be more successful than mixing them up. I always say, read the tags. If you're not sure, and if the tag isn't clear and, you're, and there's no tag, find a nurseryman and ask them before you invest your money and buy this plant that you're gonna take home and plant in the wrong place. It's gonna get too big, it has to be pruned all the time. You're losing resources. Not only you, but the water and you know the fertilizer, everything you, that that plant's gonna require, it needs to go someplace where, in theory, you shouldn't even have to prune it. You shouldn't have to deadhead it, you shouldn't have to do anything unless you choose to. Well, Stacy, this is that section between the garage and the entrance into the house. There was that bare space, and you had an idea for how to fix this area so that it was really attractive, and you did that with ground cover and then those ferns coming up through. 
Tell me about your design. Well, this is one of my go-to um, plant combinations in this situation, but also in lots of other areas of the garden that you don't want to have to maintain. Mm. So the Pachysandra creates this really lush carpet that's evergreen and glistening in the winter, and uh, the new growth is shiny. It has flowers at some point, and the bees come in here. And then I add, I like to add my favorite fern, which is the autumn fern. Brilliant is the variety of it with its bronze fronds. And this time of year, things are just kicking up. Spring, you know, it's post spring. And it's evergreen. It actually will turn green eventually. This one here is starting to turn green. Those are the new fronds that just pop right up. They, this is all you need in this space. I mean, it's there's a little bit of Hakanakaloa grass, and there's the native sword ferns to wrap around the perimeter of it to bring this into its own space, yeah. its own garden. But this is go no maintenance, go to no water. It's tough. It's it's totally sustainable. In a low light situation. In too. a low light situation, it can handle a little bit of sun. The Pachystrander won't be as lush, mm -hmm. which could be a okay thing. Mm -hmm. But this is true tested. You can't can't lose. And these plants are really easy to find in any nursery. Great combination for yeah. a lot of parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stacy worked in lots of big masses of plants, often huge swaths of the same variety. It's a necessity when you're filling an eight acre garden, but it's a technique that works in yards of any size. I think in terms of big brush strokes, and I do this even in small gardens. The difference might be three of one thing or five of one thing or 30 of one thing or 70 of one thing. It's just more plants, same plant, but more of it. So, and I do have combinations where different strokes, like I'll do a stroke of lavender and a stroke of heather and a stroke of pieris and a stroke of nandina, and they all, they all have the same requirements and the same needs, and they blend together. But by creating plants, big brush strokes, you have this flow and this rhythm that is created. The eye travels through it. It doesn't stop and focus on like, one thing here, one thing, polka dots. You don't want to do, no onesies is what we call it. Many people shy away from planting in large masses the closer they get to the house because they're worried about overcrowding the home or visually overpowering it. But Stacy says that's exactly where you need to be paying the most attention to your plantings. The numbers, the sizing, the colors, those are the details that can accentuate the home best. Stacy, what strikes me as we walk this landscape is that you have lots of pops of color everywhere, but then as we come up to the house, I really feel this sense of calmness and the soothing feel around. Well, I do that on purpose because I really like to anchor the house into the landscape so it's mm. not just like the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy <laughs> just dropped it on the landscape. Right. I like to bring in the colors, the stone and the trees and the, the foliage color on the evergreen material just to settle the house into the landscape. And I think if people want to have bright borders or some bright pops of color, that's another place to have their bright color maybe that they look out across into their landscape at. But around the house, it's something that you walk into every day, back and forth, you look out the windows, and I think a, a calmer palette is much, it makes people much, much happier. They, I just find that works much better that way. I like it. But Stacy also points out that sometimes inspiration for what goes in the design of a garden should come from what's outside the garden. I call that borrowed landscape. So uh -huh. on every job that I start and other designers do the same thing, you look around at what you can use for, for your benefit. So I look around to see how much deciduous material is out there and how much evergreen material is out there. Uh, do I, and if there's, if the deciduous tree loses its leaves in the winter, do I want to block the neighbor's house? So I might want to put a, an evergreen tree there to block that. So I try and think of what's around me before I actually plant on the property that I'm working on. So, right. um, and you can do colors too. For instance, if there's a large red maple in the distance, you can add a small red maple on the property that you're working on, and then it stacks up and looks a lot bigger, and the property looks a lot larger, and the scale change is it so right um, so that's that's a it's a good it's a really good tool to use for looking at evaluating any property any yard and it can be done anywhere anywhere 
And then I look at what shape should it be? Is it a rectangular modern house or does it have a peak? Does it have any round shapes in it? Do I want to create a round terrace to anchor the shapes on the house to the patio? You know, I try and tie it all together a little bit. This house here has a round roof, has a shaped domed roof. So there's no straight lines on this property, none, not one. They're all curves, which creates this fluid feeling like the water you hear and the air movement and the roads, the driveway in, everything has a fluid movement here. Nothing's stagnant here, everything's moving around. I wanted this feeling because you can really feel it on this property. The corridors with the big yellow cedars behind me and um, the, the beech trees and the walnut trees that were here that have been here since the 30s. And there's breeze corridors through this property which kind of influenced or definitely influenced how I wanted to, how I was drawn through the property, through the land. This all sounds kind of you know, mystical, but land does speak to you. I do believe that. And this particular piece of property is, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty magical. It really is. Stacy's core principles for sustainability aren't highly technical or overly complicated. They're the things gardeners have always done and things you can do in your own landscape, regardless of size. The right plant in the right place, working with what nature has given you, not adding anything unnecessary. And that goes right down to fighting the urge to give those plants a chemical boost. So when I plant any garden, I only fertilize once. I use a uh, organic 555 multi-purpose with microbes, a little handful in each hole, that's it. I never fertilize again. It seems to me that people that fertilize all the time, the plant will outgrow what it says it's going to grow. There's more foliage, less flowers, less blooms. Um, it'll be leggy. It just outgrows the size that it's just been overfed, you know, and it's just going to grow too much. And it's not going to maintain the scale and the flow of the rest of the garden that you wanted, like the tags, like your homework, like you planned. The more educated you are, the more sustainable your garden's going to be because it it'll, it'll thrive on its own with very little care. It doesn't, sustainability doesn't mean to me native, wild, you know, let it be, let nature take care of it. Sustainable to me just means that the garden can sustain itself without much care from you because the plants will have their, their needs met. You will not have to, you know, take care of them. They'll take care of themselves. That's what sustainability is all about. And you'll have great pleasure and you'll be proud of what you did and you'll have many years of a healthy garden to enjoy. Very few of us will ever have to design a visually stunning, ecologically sustainable landscape over eight and a half acres on a place like Whidbey Island. But the more I walked around Midden Cove, and after I got past all those jaw-dropping views, I kept thinking about that old saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Because as overwhelming as everything about this epic landscape project was, Stacy tackled it one fundamental concept, one basic gardening truth, one environmental practice, one bed, one plant at a time. And that's why this landscape worked. And that's why all successful landscapes work. Hopefully today you found something to inspire you to create a more sustainable and attractive landscape in your own home garden. If you'd like to learn more about Stacy and her work or watch this episode again, you can do that on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for watching everybody. I'm Joe Lample and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.